Good evening. It's a joy to be here. This has been a thrill. I so wish John Wilson could have been here tonight. I was able to be at Springfield the uh, latter part of August to celebrate with him his 96th birthday. And that man was my second graduate degree. Uh, he planted in me this uh, heart for ministry and passion for personal evangelism. I was scared to death to go to people's houses. And every morning in the office, he'd say something like, where'd you go last night? And if I hadn't been anywhere, he wanted to know why I wasn't somewhere. And so I had to learn to go visit people. And he put in me this spirit of personal evangelism. I'll always be thankful. I called him a couple years ago, the day after New Year's, and I said, uh, what are you doing? And he said, well, I had a couple funerals this week and uh, been a couple people's house teaching them to become Christian. And I'm meeting a restaurant right now with a 16-year-old boy who's struggling with life. He was 94 years old. I was scared to death he was going to ask me, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And uh, I love this area of the state. I, I, I asked Tom Thurman if I could marry his daughter on the campus of CCU. And um, he, he should have said no. He'd have gotten a better son-in-law. But he said yes. And then I was there the night in his den uh, in Cincinnati when he was struggling whether to come be the preacher at Christ Church at Mason. And he left, the door, left the, through the door. He said, I don't know what I'm going to tell him tonight. But he came back, and he had accepted this, the call to come to this congregation. He was here in the early 80s. And then we had lots of good discussions when, his time, uh, when he was serving as editor of CRA about editorials and people he was meeting and places he was speaking. And I, I had the best father-in-law in the world. And I know so many of you loved him, and he loved you, and I appreciate that. No creed but Christ. Several years ago, before his tragic death in a car accident, Rich Mullins surprised his fans by including on his CD the singing of the Apostles' Creed. It seems that before his untimely death, Mullins was embracing some ancient traditions of historic Christianity. The song, entitled Creed, sung in the style of fast-paced chant, builds to a refrain that explains why Mullins adopted the creed as a statement of his own faith. The words he sang are, And I believe that what I believe is what makes me what I am. I did not make it. No, it is making me. It is the very truth of God and not the invention of man. It's a bit of a mixed message, in my opinion. He was singing about the impact of truth, but he was also singing about man's tendency to frame truth by his own design. And while I do appreciate Rich's desire to return to ancient roots, his error, in my opinion, was at least twofold. His return wasn't ancient enough, and what he returned to was indeed the invention of man. Barton W. Stone was convinced that the division among God's people is rooted in creeds. That's not popular thinking among those in denominations. To them, it seems reasonable that something ought to state with clarity and brevity what a fellowship believes. But creeds, by nature, do not welcome people into unity. Consider the times and occasions when we've gone to a website or picked up literature when uh, visiting different places, and we've scoured for some indication of the background of the author or the designer of the website. We're not looking for a creed. We're just simply uh, looking for something that will tell us how this person is identified. By nature, we read with a critical eye. We wonder at the meaning behind words and phraseology. Now, if that's true in the casual explanation of theology, how much more so in the condensing of theology for the purpose of formally identifying a religious body? Now, I don't want to sound overly critical. My purpose is not to degrade or to be condescending toward those who hold the creeds. At the same time, all of us must guard against such statements which, though well-intentioned, do more to rob truth of its power than grant it. None of us 
are naive concerning the issues that arose in the early years of the church. We need only to read a few chapters into the book of Acts or read any of Paul's letters to understand how quickly man struggles with implementing God's outline for being healthy as his church. We can't read past the New Testament years before realizing that false doctrine was going to be a primary enemy of God's church. By 200 AD, the church had grown significantly, and it seems that the problems were deepening as well. The major pressures of the day were twofold. One, internally corrupting, and the other, externally invasive. From within, false teaching was threatening to undermine truth. From without, there was persecution to be reckoned with. And out of that struggle, the church responded in various ways, one of them being the development of creeds, a formal statement of doctrinal stance. Now, while many were authored, there were seven major ones that arose that grew out of councils that met between 325 and 787 A.D. The first four of these were called by Constantine. He had a great desire to see Christians unite. And the primary question for debate was a good one. Was Jesus Christ God or was he not? It needed to be answered as false teaching increased in fervor. And out of these councils emerged statements to underscore what the Bible says about Jesus. It was out of Nicaea that the first official creed by an ecumenical council was written. Man now entered a new arena of authoritarian dominance. On the surface, sounded like a good thing, but it didn't really end any controversy. Indeed, controversy continued through the centuries. It, it may seem pious, it may seem intelligent, it may seem rational to journey toward the writing of creeds. But in fact, unity fails to be accomplished. I, I would grant that if they were written merely as human opinion and remained subject to close scrutiny, perhaps some good could arise. But that's not the nature of creeds. That's not our experience with them. Man tends to regulate, he tends to rule, he tends to confine, he tends to limit and draw life away from truth. He never improves upon it. Which one of us preachers, after studying much and struggling in sermonizing, would haughtily suggest that our message supersedes the very text we are expounding. Who would ever leave the place of proclamation with the audacity to even privately, secretly, believe that he has fully communicated the life and spirit of a text without limitation or hindrance? That is an absurd thought. It is quintessential arrogance. While creeds may be intended to help, the risk in employing them is too great. There are some reasons why creeds harm. Number one, creeds can be a catalyst for false doctrine. Alfred Lord Whited once said, wherever there is a creed, there is a heretic round the corner or in his grave. <laughs> we might well add, wherever there is a creed, there is a tendency to heresy. For instance, the Council of Trent held in the mid-1500s, the doctrine, the doctrine of, of transubstantiation. Justification, they said, was by faith and works. Purgatory was reaffirmed, and the Apocrypha was added to the Scriptures. I remind us all that Paul wrote to Timothy, What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it 
with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The second, creeds tend to carry authority equal to the scriptures. It's tempting for a person to value their creeds to the point that they are used to defend one's faith as quickly or quicker than the Bible itself. The Word of God is our final authority for faith and practice. How easily creeds move from being opinion to being an equal standard with the Bible. It is one thing to offer an explanation of what the Bible says. We do that in preaching and in teaching. But a creed is a humanly written statement that is accepted as a standard. And when that happens, it occupies the same place as God's word. That cannot happen. Number three, creeds tend toward misuse of scriptures. In the authoring of creeds, it's relatively easy to appeal to scripture to confirm one's creed than to form it. We preachers face the frustration of helping people who are visiting our congregations rethink the matters of faith they bring with them that are unbiblical. We struggle with that. How often you and I are frustrated when after a deeper examination of a text, we hear a response like, yes, I see what you mean, but I just feel that the influence of creeds and their misuse was what so frustrated Barton W. Stone. And referring to creeds, he wrote, the people have the privilege of reading the scriptures to prove the standard to be right, but no privilege to examine it by scripture and prove it to be wrong. Number four, creeds tend to complicate rather than simplify. You know, it's, it's our nature, it's certainly my nature, to complicate God's simple message rather than preach it in a simple fashion. We preachers, I think, are particularly gifted at it. I know I am even as a father. I recall that in preparing my son for the temptations that would c come to him, it was time to have that father-son talk about sex. And so I figured a camp out overnight with my son would be good. And so I got all ready. I rehearsed in my mind what I would say to him to introduce this subject to an eight-year-old. So there we were under the stars, and I had in mind that this was going to be a dramatic memory in his mind the rest of his life when my dad talked to me honestly about important things. I said two sentences, and he responded, Dad, am I going to need a dictionary for this? <laughs> my fear is I tend to do that in preaching and teaching. Creeds are especially well known for that. Consider this quote from the Creed of Chalcedon that, met in, that was written in 451, in, or the Council of Chalcedon, 451. And speaking of the two natures of Christ, it says, the distinction of natures being in no way abolished because of the union, but rather the characteristic property of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and one entity. Any questions? <laughs> how simple, how direct the words of Scripture. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Five, creeds tend to miss the point. We are called to holy living. Jesus taught us the mystery of the seed that's planted and bears fruit. Creeds, being man's device, man's words, do not bring life. They are not capable of penetrating and dividing soul and spirit and joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Even if a creed is well written and we find nothing of significance to disagree written in it, it can never be a living document 
that searches our souls and convicts us of sin or that trains us in righteousness. Creeds are powerless to do so. It is Christ alone who transforms. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Six, creeds tend to detract from the scriptures. Now again, I don't think that this is necessarily intentional by man, but what is intentional and what is actual needs to be understood. Well-intentioned, a man stands on the word of God, he writes a creed, and his tendency is to begin standing on the creed which is out of the word of God. And as time passes, one tends to stay acquainted and in the general territory of the word of God, but such general nearness is not God-pleasing. We are to be firmly rooted in it. The distraction also comes when debate occurs centering about, around what man has said rather than what God has said. A creed written by the Maasai people of Africa in recent years reads this way. We believe in the one high God who out of love created the beautiful world and everything good in it. He created man and wanted man to be happy in the world. God loves the world and every nation and tribe on the earth. We have known this high God in darkness and now we know him in the light. God promised in the book of his word, the Bible, that he would save the world and all the nations and tribes. We believe that God made good his promise by sending his son, Jesus Christ, a man in the flesh, a Jew by tribe, po born poor in a little village, who left his home and was always on safari doing good, curing people by the power of God, teaching about God and man, showing the meaning of religion is love. He was rejected by his people, tortured and nailed hands and feet to a cross and died. He lay buried in the grave. But the hyenas did not touch him. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. He ascended to the skies. He is the Lord. We believe that all our sins are forgiven through him. All who have faith in him must be sorry for their sins, be baptized in the Holy Spirit of God, live the rules of love, and share the bread together in love to announce the good news to others until Jesus comes again. We're waiting for him. He's alive. He lives. They we believe. Amen. Now, admittedly, we hear in these words the deep sincerity of, of these people of faith. But would there be phrases that we might suggest could be worded differently? Are there some things that we don't fully agree with that's written here? There's all kinds of room of discussion of maybe the length of it or how it could be shortened. All kinds of discussion could come about. So I cannot stand with them on everything. Any discussion then ends up focusing on their wording instead of God's truth. It's a detraction from the word. Number seven, creeds tend to divide, not unify. One would naively suppose that a body of people, small body, could come together to devise a common statement that would conclude in unity. And perhaps by some stretch, it may happen in a small enough group. One naive believer, believer worshiping in a small congregation in Berea, Kentucky said, I love saying the Nicene Creed, precisely because it connects me with Christians all the way back to the third century. I love saying the old words. I just interpret them differently for our time. For me, it is important that when we say the words of a creed, we step into a mystery, the same sort of mystery. Well, as I see it, the only mystery about it is why he's so drawn to something that only goes back to the third century instead of the first century and has to be reinterpreted for our time. Let's say it's possible for a group of people to absolutely agree on the wording of a creed. History has shown that such is not the case 
beyond a group like that. People have difficulty being united in anything. That's why our desire is to know fully God's truth. Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. God's Son unites. Creeds do not. And if we fail to unite based on Christ himself, it is certainly not God's fault, but the fault of sinful man. What foolish pride to think that we can unite based on our own humanly contrived words instead of God's living word and his written word. Number eight, creeds at their best are superfluous. Let's assume that it's possible for man to write a perfect statement representing sound theology set forth in Scripture. If that's true, then why have it at all? Why run the risk of harming our joyful journey into the riches of God's Word by adding any document that would insufficiently restate it? To say no creed but Christ is to aver that the central unifying feature of our faith is a person and not a document. While the written word of God is our sole source for faith and practice, it is the living word, God's one and only Son, who is our great unifier. There is no need for a creed, for Christ is our all in all. He alone is sufficient. And because of that central truth, we have a responsibility. It is Christ we must preach. We preachers of this 21st century are easily caught up in fine-sounding styles of communication. I'm afraid that too much of our preaching has slid into shallow presentations that provide clear help for the present needs but rarely take us to the depths of the person of Christ so that we might know the fullness of God. If Christ is our sufficiency, he must be preached as such and exalted as the king, worthy of our full dependence. And if we are going to be healthy as churches, let's return to the study and the practice of, of elements of the scripture like the prayers of Paul as he pours himself out to Christ for the sake of the church. What an impact. A, an extended study of Ephesians 3 would make in the life of our congregations. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power. He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in the inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Our preaching should reflect this kind of passionate heart if Christ is indeed our only creed. People's lives change as the fullness of God is discovered, explored, and embraced. Let's preach to that end. And second, it's our responsibility. 
to teach and understand. It is Christ on whom we must depend. I have too often depended on my own giftedness, creativity, and church programming to attract unbelievers to Jesus. When we say no creed but Christ, it must be translated into life as a full reliance on His Spirit within us to guide, shape, challenge, and grow His kingdom. It is to say with the Baptist, He must increase, I must decrease. It is to say with those who are weak in faith, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. It is to say with Stephen, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is to say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am so thankful to have been raised in a movement free of creedal statements and to have teachers and preachers who knew the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ and preached that way. These words I close with from Charles Spurgeon. They are worthy ones to heed. Remember, sinner, it is not thy hold of Christ that saves thee. It is Christ. It is not thy joy in Christ that saves thee. It is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, though that is the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merits. Therefore, look not to thy hope, but to Christ, the source of thy hope. Look not to thy faith, but to Christ, the author and finisher of thy faith. And if thou dost that, ten thousand devils cannot throw thee down. There is one thing which we, all of us, too much be cloud in our preaching, though I believe we do it very unintentionally, namely, the great truth that it is not prayer, it is not faith, it is not our doings, it is not our feelings upon which we must rest, but upon Christ and on Christ alone. We are apt to think that we are not in a right state, that we do not feel enough, instead of remembering that our business is not with self, but Christ. Let me beseech thee, look only to Christ. Never expect deliverance from self, from ministers, or from any means of any kind apart from Christ. Keep thine eye simply on him. Let his death his agonies, his groans, his sufferings, his merits, his glories, his intercession be fresh upon thy mind. When thou wakest in the morning, look for him. When thou liest down at night, look for him.